If folks can take seats, please. Appreciate it. The next panel is going to look at managing nuclear power post Fukushima, and we've got three distinguished speakers. First, Mr. George Felgate, who until just recently was the managing director of the World Association of Nuclear Operators. Uh, he had a long career at the Institute of Nuclear Power Operators in the United States uh, in a variety of leadership positions there, including the vice president of plant operations and the vice president of analysis. Also, Mr. Dr. Tatsu Suzuki, who's the vice chairman of the Japan Atomic Energy Commission, uh, also a longtime figure in this field, previously worked at the Central Research Institute of the Nuclear of the Electric Power Industry in Japan, and was a professor at the University of Tokyo. And then lastly, somebody who probably does not need an introduction to this audience is Deputy Secretary of Energy Dan Poneman. He's had a very distinguished government career, previously served on the National Security Council staff. He's practiced law in Washington, D.C., and has written books that most of you probably have on your bookshelves and have studied quite well. Let me introduce at this point Dan Poneman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. It's always good to come back to nuke stock, as we commonly call it. And to see so many familiar faces. Uh, it's, uh, it's been two years now since the searing experience that uh, I think is etched in many of our memories, March 11th, 2011. And I think people will always uh, remember there uh, where they were when they heard the news. I know I remember. Uh, it's uh, a day to remember and a day to take very seriously in terms of the implications for nuclear energy globally. And uh, this group, the Carnegie Conference, has spent so much time working on the toughest issues and challenges that face nuclear issues, nuclear energy, that it is fitting and proper that they take up the challenges uh, not only in nonproliferation space, but obviously also in nuclear safety space. And so we have uh, here assembled uh, a very august uh, set of experts to help us understand some of these issues. So here are some of the questions that we need to be thinking about, need to be addressing now, two years after the accident and the terrible tragedy of the tsunami at Fukushima. Where are we? in term, terms of civil nuclear power development and sustainability? What lessons have we individually and collectively learned? And what paths are our governments taking in terms of building their sustainable, secure energy futures? And what role do they see nuclear as having in that future? For our part, the United States has been consistent. Within a few days of the events at Fukushima, President Obama uh, stepped out into the Rose Garden and restated the United States commitment to safe pursuit of nuclear energy. When he noted that, and I'm quoting here, when we see a crisis like the one in Japan, we have a responsibility to learn from this event and to draw from those lessons to ensure the safety and security of our people. So the president asked the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to conduct a comprehensive review of the safety of the existing U.S. fleet of 104 operating reactors across the country in light of the uh, events and the lessons learned from the Fukushima accident, and they did that. Uh, so in July of that year, a high-level Nuclear Regulatory Commission task force completed a 90-day review of the agency's regulatory oversight and safety standards given the insights from Fukushima. The task force first concluded that there was no imminent risk from the continued operation of the United States nuclear power plants. And the NRC is continuing to work with industry to address the recommendations that require uh, longer term research and evaluation and to take uh, into account all of the recommendations that that task force uh, came up with. Now, we are building in the United States our first set of nuclear power plants uh, since our own uh, searing memory, which I also remember where I was, March 1979, Three Mile Island, led to a 30-year hiatus uh, in the construction of commercial nuclear power plants in this country. Four units are under construction right now, two at Vogel in Georgia and 
two at the summer site in South Carolina, and we continue to incorporate the lessons learned from Fukushima into our approach to nuclear safety, both for our current generation facilities as well as for our next generation reactors. Around the world, governments are having to make their own decisions, sovereign decisions regarding the future of their own domestic nuclear programs, and to weigh those decisions against energy, climate, national security, and of course, safety challenges. But we've seen many uh, nations come to a similar conclusion to the conclusion that we have drawn, which is that pursued safely, nuclear energy can play an important part uh, as part of our long-term low-carbon energy portfolio. When it comes to combating the ever more serious threat of climate change, we do need an all of the above approach to energy, as President Obama has often stated. Nuclear safety is also an area where we have to take advantage of the best practices that many of us are developing in our own countries. The continuing dialogue taking place through the IAEA is an essential part of this conversation, and perhaps some of you here did as well, but just yesterday we had a very good conversation with Director General Yukia Amano, who has played a very strong leadership role uh, in this area and continues to do so. Uh, I would particularly note that the IAEA safety ministerials, which uh, I had the opportunity to uh, attend the first one, I think, in June of 2011, and of course, the very productive meeting that uh, followed up in Fukushima last year, have been a very important part of this whole process. I want to be clear that the United States uh, remains and will remain a dedicated partner to our bilateral and multilateral uh, engagements in this issue. We uh, obviously also have to remain equally assiduous in pursuing our nonproliferation agenda because, as I have often said, I think including at this forum in years past, just as in the area of safety, an accident uh, anywhere is an accident everywhere, so too when it comes to nonproliferation. Uh, anything that affects any of us in any country of the world uh, will immediately be felt elsewhere and everywhere. And so we have to be extremely focused the President has made this obviously a very uh, central element of his overall national security agenda and sketched out, I think, a, a comprehensive and uh, ambitious agenda in Prague in April 2009 with a number of elements. We already have the New START Treaty uh, to show for those efforts. We have continued our efforts on the four-year lockdown on vulnerable nuclear materials. And, of course, the President also called on that occasion for a new civil framework for peaceful nuclear cooperation. He laid out a vision for that framework that could assure all nations living up to international nonproliferation norms that they can rely on the commercial marketplace to reliably provide the fuel services that they need to operate their nuclear power plants. So for each of these issues that I've laid out, and which I, I've seen in the, this audience at least three or four experts on each one, uh, this panel of experts that have assembled on stage, as well as uh, many of you out there uh, in the audience, are uh, extraordinarily well suited to discuss these and to help shed light and understanding. These conversations, indeed, I think are critical. It provides a safe haven for a lot of conversations that allow people in government to communicate uh, freely, test out ideas, uh, get uh, understanding of best practices. It's a healthy robust dialogue and one that I very much hope will continue. So you've already heard uh, the introductions of our distinguished colleagues, Mr. Felgate and Mr. Suzuki, and I'm now going to uh, open up briefly with a conversation with the panelists uh, for about 25 minutes, and then during the final part of our hour, we will take mm. questions from the audience. Thank you. So I feel like, like David Frost or something here. <laughs> you can pretend it's Davos. Uh, so uh, we might as well start with an open-ended question, and uh, we'll make this, as they say, a toss-up. Uh, uh, perhaps we'll uh, start at the, at the far end. Uh, but the question I'd ask uh, George uh, is, uh, can nuclear power programs be managed safely uh, and securely? Well, first, let me... Uh offer my thanks to Carnegie for inviting me to this important conference. It's certainly been a pleasure uh, to be a part of this uh, gathering. 
<clears throat> and if I can um, depart from the rules maybe a little bit here, uh, I imagine there's a fair number of people out there who have no clue what the World Association of Nuclear Operators is. So if I can take one minute, and I promise no more than that. We were formed in 1989 following the Chernobyl accident. It's a non-for-profit organization, and its mission is to share best practices or promote standards of excellence in the operation of nuclear plants around the world. Every operator of a commercial nuclear power plant is a member of WANO, everyone, 100%. That's 437 operating units, two fuel reprocessing facilities, a medical isotope production reactor, and a fleet of Russian ice, nuclear-powered icebreakers. Um, we do peer reviews of our members, all of them. We have visited every nuclear plant in the world. We uh, provide technical assistance. We collect and share operating experience. So I won't say more than that, but if um, there's questions after, I'll be available for the rest of the conference. The short answer to your question is yes. I believe, uh, I believe it can be managed safely. It's a demanding technology. It requires a, certainly a definite and specific and different approach by leadership to <coughs> managing the technology. But we learned a great deal after Three Mile Island. We uh, many lessons learned. Following Chernobyl, there was a different set of lessons learned, but we strengthen our industry as a result of uh, Chernobyl. And I believe the same is true from Fukushima, a different set of lessons learned, but again, a stronger industry. I do think there are three prerequisites to being managed safely. One is a utility that, if it's going to get into the business of nuclear power, accepts and adopts safety first, nuclear safety first, as an overriding priority. There can be no other top priority for the organization. The second, we heard a number of speakers say yesterday, is a, an effective, independent, strong regulator. And the third, I think, is an, is an organization like WANO. And I say like WANO because there are other national organizations that do similar things. The Institute of Nuclear Power Operations in the U.S., Jansi in Japan, uh, Vinayas in Russia. But an organization that takes the best practices, shares it, does peer reviews, provides assistance, helps one another achieve that never achievable target of excellence. So yes, I believe it, it, it can be managed safely. Uh, and Tatsu, if I may just put sure. the same question to you as well. Oh, sure. They are, I, I quite agree with him. Basically, uh, uh, nuclear power plant can be operated safely. But just, uh, but uh, I have to just tell you the one thing before I go on. Uh, I think right now uh, we have to remind, I have to remind you, all of you, that the uh, Fukushima accident is not completely over yet. And on site, Still, many people working every day, uh, exposing their uh, work. I mean, workers uh, taking a risk to manage the plant. And as you know, uh, uh, even a small rat can cut the power lines. And we have also 270 tons of uh, high radioactive water is leaking. So the on-site management is still a long way to go. And also off-site. Uh, 160,000 people still away, away from home, uh, wondering where, where and where and where we, they can come back to their home and have a chance to uh, go to the Fukushima area and talk to the local people. It is, it is heartbreaking to talk to those people uh, about their uh, anxiety, anger, frustration over what happened, and I feel personally I uh, feel very sorry for what happened. So the first point I'd like to say is that the uh, Fukushima accident is not completely over yet. So we have to keep in mind when we talk about the safety and the uh, future of nuclear power. So just to follow up on that, uh, you know, many of us have had a long standing dialogue, fortunately preceding uh, Fukushima with uh, many of you, our colleagues, you and I have known each other, and I think in those early days 
after March 11th when it was quite unclear what was actually happening. A lot of those informal uh, contacts and, and relationships and professional uh, friendships that had developed over the years were very helpful. But we watched then as Japan, the whole country, has gone through um, searing self-reflection. Yes. Uh, and now we've seen two different uh, political parties dealing with that, uh, DPJ and now the LDP. So what is your sense, uh, Tatsu, and I understand that it's a changing picture and, and very hard to get a comprehensive sense, and, and there are many, many different views, but as to the overall future of nuclear energy in Japan? At this moment, uh, as I said, um, the first priority is to, to fix the problem of Fukushima and uh, uh, to uh, uh, solve the problem of the people away from home. And unless we tackle those problems uh, appropriately, we cannot, I don't think we can discuss the long-term future of nuclear energy much. Uh, having said that, we have to deal with the uh, energy supply demand issues every day. In the short term, I, I believe that um, as soon as the new safety standards are established, uh, it's, we have to move on to uh, whether which reactor will be safe to operate to make sure that the uh, uh, public will accept uh, such conditions. Otherwise, uh, we are losing uh, 3 trillion uh, yen every year to buy fossil fuel. In the short term, that is one of the most important energy issues for Japan, how to restart up the current uh, existing nuclear power plants. Uh, it's a fair point. Uh, you can't get to the long term without getting to the short term, obviously, and uh, nor should we. And uh, it's uh, imperative, obviously, to come fully to terms with, with the case at hand. I wonder if I might then uh, turn back to George uh, I, if my memory serves, I think INPO was born out of Three Mile Island, uh, and uh, I think you've acknowledged also the tremendous uh, experiences, learning experiences that came out of both Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. Uh, and obviously, WANO was the international uh, response there. In terms of looking at those experiences, what happened then, and looking at Fukushima today, how would you compare the kinds of responses that are coming out uh, in terms of uh, WANA's participation in development of best practices? What kind of specific uh, elements of response are uh, coming up through uh, WANO that may help us, in fact, uh, both in the case of Japan in particular, but all countries really apply the right kinds of lessons to their own nuclear programs? Well, this, uh, this is a subject, the lessons learned, it's at the core of what WANO is all about. And we've devoted uh, the best part of the last two years to gather the information, distribute the lessons learned, and, there's, and they're in two groups. They're in lessons learned for our industry, and then there's lessons learned for WANO, because uh, you have to look, at, look in a mirror and say, could we, what could we have done more as an organization to have uh, had an influence on the outcome of that event. If I understand your question, you're asking more of the latter. Um, we, WANO formed in the wake of Chernobyl, was totally focused on prevention. Prevention, prevention, prevention. Never again was sort of the, the, the saying following Chernobyl. So if you look at all the programs that the industry, we, WANO, the industry focused on, it were things like reactivity management, uh, operator human performance tools to improve the human performance of operators, conservative decision making by operators in the control room, by the management team at the site. Everything focused on prevention. I think the big learning both for WANO and for the industry is this need to not for a minute take our eyes off of prevention, not for one second, but to shift and add mitigation, to recognize that another accident may occur somewhere in the world, and when it does, be able to mitigate it so that 
thousands and thousands of people are not negatively impacted uh, by the consequences of the accident. And so severe accident management, emergency preparedness, um, the way we now look at uh, on-site fuel storage are all new additions to both Wano, uh, well, primarily Wano. They're always present in the industry, but they are now stronger to a much, a much stronger than prior to Fukushima. I could talk uh, the rest of the hour about lessons learned, but uh, I, I won't. Uh, yeah, you know, well, there's uh, plenty of grist for the mill, but I might just uh, skinny it down now and, and turn to Tatsu and ask, in particular, having just heard that from George, and your own work in Japan in terms of lessons learned from Fukushima, supplemented by lessons learned from Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, how, uh, how do you assess the most important lessons uh, not only for Japan, but for other uh, countries who are going down the nuclear energy path? My short answer to that is that uh, uh, to think unthinkable. Uh, we were not totally prepared for something of this scale uh, what happened, and uh, emergency preparedness was not ready, and uh, training program was not also sufficient. And both the utilities, the government, and all of us uh, did not expect this kind of thing to happen. So the mo most significant lesson, I, I think, is in the future is think unthinkable. Uh, that's my short answer. Um, that seems right to me, because I know conversations I had going back many years. Uh, Anything that fell outside the four corners of the design basis threat, right. uh, people were just not, not in every case, but in, in some cases they were not doing that. And uh, uh, I have become much less skeptical about the whole <clears throat> virtue of exercises on contingencies that you think will never happen. One gets very busy in government, you think, I don't have time for this exercise, but believe me, the one thing you know is you don't want the first time to be the real deal. <laughs> uh, so I think that's, uh, that's a very good lesson. So, uh, uh, George, help us understand then, uh, you're dealing at the level of operators, obviously. Uh, one of the things that tends to happen in international responses to intense events is, as Jimmy Durante used to say, everyone wants to get into the act. So will you help us think through uh, what role, for example, IAEA plays vis-a-vis -vis WANO, vis-a-vis -vis NEA, and so forth, and, and how, how we can make sure that we're doing the right things, applying the right lessons through the right fora, uh, but not tripping over each other and duplicating efforts uh, or letting balls fall between the stools. Yeah, that's a, uh, I'll be honest, it's a worry of mine. We have the IAEA increasing the number of OSART missions to operating plants. We have uh, WANO increasing the frequency of our peer reviews to all operating plants to once every four years. We have uh, in Europe the European Commission stress tests and the decision to continue uh, on-site inspections as part of that process. At some point, the sheer number of inspections being conducted can have a negative impact on safety. Um, it's a, can be, it can become well-intentioned, but it can become a distraction to the operators. So. Coordination, accepting one another's review, what I call equivalency, is uh, something that WANA was looking at very closely. Maintaining the standard high, but taking credit for other organizations' reviews. I think another, um, we have a close relationship with the IAE. We have a memorandum of understanding with them. We share some information not confidential information, WANO confidential information, but some information. But in my opinion, the area that is needed is a stronger look at regulators. It's completely off the table for WANO. We're, we look at plant operations. But I think IAEA, the governments being the organizations that support IAEA, are in the best position to do hard-hitting, thorough reviews of independence and effectiveness of national regulators. In fact, I would like to see that be their emphasis 
and have them back out of the operating plant peer reviews and let organizations like Wano manage uh, that, that part of the lessons. No, well, that's good uh, food for perhaps further discussion uh, when we open it up. But uh, I don't want to let the moment pass without uh, taking the opportunity to ask uh, Tansu Suzuki. I think there's a lot of attention uh, in this country and probably many others focused on the reorganization of your own system, the establishment of the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, which came up in the last government but is now uh, transitioning into the new regime. Can you explain for the uh, benefit of the audience here what the new structure is and how it compares to the old structure? Uh, it is complicated, and I don't know how many Japanese also understand the situation. Uh, uh, the newly established nuclear regulation, regulatory authority is, is now, legally speaking, is truly independent, and which is different from the previous uh, 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 regulators. And another important thing is uh, uh, combining the three functions, nuclear safety, nuclear security, and safeguards under one roof used to be uh, distributed. So it will be more, more probably effective. And third thing is that uh, uh, so-called emergency preparedness has been improved. They set up a new uh, permanent uh, council, so-called Council on Nuclear Prevention uh, or Disaster. The chairman is uh, prime minister. And in case of accident, move to uh, nuclear disaster management uh, uh, headquarters. So it's uh, uh, now the regularly the, the government uh, have a meeting to discuss the prevention of nuclear disaster. So those are three things are important to note. Okay, and, and then I think George may have mentioned in his opening remarks the uh, National Industry Associations of Operators that have been set up. Uh, George, what advice would you have for Tansu and his colleagues uh, as Japan is trying to bolster its uh, organization of operators, uh, lessons learned from your own experiences both at IMPO and at WANO? Uh, well, I think there's some important principles that have made WANO successful over the years, made organizations like INPO in the U.S. successful. Uh, that would be uh, where I would look for advice. One is that um, the organization um, needs to have the direct involvement of the CEOs. Uh, that's extremely important. If the CEO sets the tone for his entire organization, if the CEO is directly involved in, we're talking about Jansi, the, the uh, IMPO-like organization in Japan, is directly involved, then it sends an important message throughout the whole organization. The staff has to be high quality and uh, credible. They'll have a group of from Jansi coming into the nuclear power plant, and the people at the plant, their first question will be, who are these people? What do they know? What, do they, what can they bring to the table? So the staff of any organization like INPO, WANO, or JANSI has to be credible, knowledgeable, experienced people, managers in their own right. And a very controversial issue is public versus private. Uh, I will tell you, since uh, Fukushima, this, is, this debate has raged with, within WANO. And uh, uh, John C. has decided in a public approach, meaning their reports of their reviews will be made available to the public. WANO has for many years and continues that our reports are private between WANO and its members. I believe it's important to, be, to maintain that confidentiality with the members. It leads to greater depth of the issues that we identify, more candor in the issues, the reports are not written for public consumption. In other words, um, they're hard hitting. And uh, I believe you lose something if you, I know this is controversial, but you lose something if you make, put that report out in the public arena. So those would be three yeah. items. Okay, and the last question before we open it up to the uh, audience, and uh, having uh, heard what you said, Tatsu, about not really being able to take a very long-term perspective until you get over the current uh, challenges. That having been said, you now have obviously a couple of the reactors are operating and there's at least discussion that 
at some relatively early stage, uh, more will resume, uh, which raises the whole question about the fuel cycle yes. and the used fuel arisings coming out uh, from the current operations. And what does that say about Rocasho? What's, what's happening? What's the latest on Rocasho? What's uh, the latest in terms of Manju? Because um, obviously the accumulation of uh, uh, used fuel arisings create other challenges in the non-proliferation space. Uh, and uh, I know this is an issue that you've thought and written a lot about over the years, so right. I, I cannot resist asking. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. This is the most difficult uh, uh, policy issue right now that Japan is facing on the nuclear energy. I just said that uh, uh, we don't know what will be the long-term future of nuclear power. So Atomic Energy Commission had a long discussion and published a statement on June 21st last year Given the uncertainty of the future of nuclear power, uh, nuclear fuel cycle process should be more flexible. So uh, uh, we hope that, uh, we, we propose that uh, direct disposal of spent fuel should be a part of the fuel, uh, policy mix option. So we recommended that uh, the government should start the R&D on direct disposal, and uh, hopefully the law will change the law, under the current high-level waste law, uh, you cannot dispose uh, spent fuel in Japan. So that is not flexible. And so that's one thing. Um, the second thing is, regardless of the future of nuclear power, the immediate most important policy issue is what to do with the spent fuel. So spent fuel storage capacity should be expanded, either on-site or off-site, and probably the dry cast storage will be safer, so we recommended also uh, expansion of the storage capacity as soon as possible. That's the second one, second uh, important policy recommendation we made. Third one is uh, high-level waste disposal uh, issue. Uh, we ask Science Council of Japan to give us independent advice what to do with this uh, disposal policy, and they gave us, they gave Back, they came back to with a very harsh uh, criticism against what's happening right now. They recommended uh, not to uh, move forward for the uh, geological disposal, but instead the temporary storage, long-term storage option. So we take that recommendation very seriously to think about more again of the long-term future option of the waste disposal policy. So that's the third thing uh, we have to uh, start thinking about the uh, waste disposal. Finally. Uh, plutonium management. Uh, if the Rokasho start up, it's more likely that the uh, stockpile will probably increase. And uh, uh, under the discussion, uh, there's a, a, a reconfirmation of so-called no plutonium surplus policy, which Atomic Energy Commission think is very important. And so, uh, uh, we ask the utility to uh, submit every year uh, uh, where the plutonium we use before you reprocess. That's the policy. But this time, uh, they, uh, uh, JNFL uh, already published their plan to start operating rock casual this, this October uh, without having any particular plan uh, to use plutonium. At this moment, it's very uncertain which reactor will be operating. So uh, they finally came back to us last, actually last uh, March 26th, that they give up actually submitting the plutonium use plan at this moment, but they promised us to uh, disclose uh, plutonium use plan before they start reprocessing. So hopefully that will come. But at that time, I personally, by, this is my personal proposal uh, to improve to enhance the no-plutonium surplus policy. Three points. The first is that uh, uh, demand comes first be, instead of supply comes first. Otherwise, plutonium stockpile will continue to grow. Mm -hmm. And second point is stockpile reduction. Until I see, we see the reduction of plutonium stockpile, it's better not to start rocasho. Otherwise, we start increasing stockpile again. The third, uh, principle is that more flexible plan for plutonium use. 
At this moment, the official plan is to uh, recycle plutonium with 16 to 18 light order reactors in Japan, yeah. which is still the uh, uh, still as a part of the government policy. But as, as, as you say, we don't know how many reactors will be operating. So I propose that uh, it's, it's better to come up with a more uh, flexible option, like a backup of the uh, uh, plutonium disposition plan. For instance, that uh, the utility have a, a ownership transfer between the utility companies. So instead of 16, 18 reactors, each reactors, each utility take over the plutonium. Yeah. You can swap the plutonium. And also, UK has a disposition plan in Europe. They also uh, have a plan to take, o take over the plutonium ownership from, uh, from other uh, countries. That kind of thing should be a part of the plutonium disposition plan. So those are the three uh, uh, pr principles I propose personally uh, in the, uh, at the end of last March. So my, my point is that uh, this is one of the most important part of the uh, nuclear energy policy, which have to be uh, kept in mind in the, in, the, in the new administration. Thank you. Well, I'm sure uh, that point has engendered a lot of interest in uh, many of the people in the audience, as has uh, the rest of our discussion. I think now is the right time to open the floor. Uh, again, I see lots of uh, very familiar faces, and uh, but anyone can approach the mic. And please, to the left. Mic working. I'm Bernd Kubik from PRIF in Frankfurt, and uh, I'm glad to report it's a country that I think that draws the right uh, conclusions from Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and from Chernobyl, and that is get rid of nuclear power and try to embark on a path of renewable energy sources. And I'm surprised that none of you here considers this option as something that could be part of the game. My question to you is, in view of the causes that caused Hiroshima, that caused Fukushima and Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, wouldn't you agree with me that this range could be expanded of causes that you cannot foresee so that the next round, hopefully not, of, a, of an accident has causes that you cannot foresee and which I think endorses my case of our government and of our population, the right thing is to try to get rid of nuclear power and to find new ways. Thank you. I would just uh, allow myself a, a brief comment. Uh, when President Obama has referred to the all the above energy strategy, uh, we are heavily, heavily committed to the renewable agenda, and by the way, we're heavily committed to efficiency and reducing demand. We have more than doubled uh, new renewable power generation sources in the last four years. Last year alone, we put 14 gigawatts of wind in. We got 60 gigawatts of wind total. We've doubled from a smaller base of Middle East solar. So we will not be outflanked in our dedication uh, to that. We do believe in looking at the threat of climate change that nuclear energy safely pursued with a much later generation technologies uh, is uh, uh, obviously an important part of the s uh, solution set and uh, we'll continue to make sure that we do what you suggest, sir, in terms of trying to anticipate, and I think this goes to Tansu Suzuki's earlier point, anticipate the unanticipated uh, and uh, we are in a culture that demands continuous improvement and uh, thinking the unthinkable and I think that would have to be part of any responsible uh, approach. But I uh, would like to invite either of our colleagues to comment as well. I'll just um, briefly answer. Look, Wano is not an advocate for or against nuclear power. We can't be for the many of the reasons that were discussed yesterday in this room. I can't go into a plant one day and do a hard-hitting <coughs> review and then the next day stand up on a stage and talk about how wonderful nuclear power is. There's no credibility in that. So we are not an advocate for nuclear power, but if a country decides to go forward with nuclear, we will work with that country, that utility, uh, to make sure it is operated as safely as possible. And to your second point about, uh, we aren't taking the lessons from Fukushima and preparing our industry to handle tsunamis. 
we're taking the lessons from uh, Fukushima to put in place mitigation steps that can handle a broad range of initiating events, initiating events that we can't even conceive today. Um, I think that's the le learning. If we start to guard against specific events, someone will always come up with one more scenario we didn't think of. So to better, to blanket the entire un things you can't conceive of and put in place steps that limit the consequences if the unthinkable does happen. We have four, four mics and I see a large number. I'm going to ask my colleagues, and I'll try to do this too, for us to be brief in, in our responses, and I don't think we should all three feel obliged to answer all questions. And if I could ask our uh, questioners to both uh, uh, say who you are and then also be brief in your question, I think wow. we'll have a shot at getting through uh, at least most of the, the questions. I'm just going to alternate mics, so go ahead, sir. Thank you. My name is Christian Renghi for the week. UX consulting company. My question is to Mr. Fairgate. Uh, have there been discussions within WANO and its members about what to do in case some members do not follow up with the recommendations of WANO? Uh, I know that you grab reports, but I'm just wondering whether ha they're having discussions about how to proceed with a member who is not, let's say, complying with some of your recommendations. Yes, so accountability. What if a member gets an area for improvement and decides to do nothing with it. We have an escalation policy leading up to termination or removal of the member from WANA. Now, you might argue that's the worst thing you can do. If you've got a member that's got problems, you're going to remove them from the organization and they pose a risk then to every other operator in the world. So it's never come to that. Peer pressure, contacting the government if necessary, uh, contacting uh, having a delegation of CEOs visit the CEO who is not meeting their obligations has, in every case that I've been involved in, been effective. Thank you, George. Professor Sagan. Scott Sagan from Stanford University. My question is for Tatsu, and it is uh, about the security lessons learned from a safety incident. If I were a terrorist organization, I would put um, attacks on spent fuel ponds or internal sabotage to create another kind of accident-like sabotage event higher on my list of priorities seeing the enormous human costs and economic costs of Fukushima. What specifically have you done to uh, address the security problems that Fukushima uh, identified? Where are there synergies between what you've done on safety and security, and where are there tensions or, 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 or um, lack of synergy, and specifically, what, in terms of the insider threat, have you done? Can you tell us more about the personnel reliability program advances uh, post 311? Yes, uh, Atomic Energy Commission uh, actually uh, issued the report before the function moved to uh, new, 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 new reg nuclear regulatory authority regarding the uh, security issues after Fukushima. One of them was actually uh, the personnel reliability questions, and the recommendation was, was to introduce the so-called security clearance uh, uh, system in Japan, and hopefully the government will introduce a law to uh, uh, make it the legal requirement for the workers on, uh, on site, uh, nuclear power plants and facilities, to have a security clearance. Thank you. Uh, Dan Horner. Hi, Dan Horner from Arms Control today. Um, I have a couple of questions to Professor Suzuki. Could you clarify the situation with Rokasho? I, I thought I understood from your remarks there's a possibility it would be the startup would be deferred beyond October, or were you implying it might not start up at all? If, just if you could uh, sure. explain what the range of options is. And also, you talked about the flexibility, introducing more flexibility. If there, is, if there are these various options you've discussed, um, how would that affect the commitments that have been made to the Japanese utilities with regard to the disposition of their spent fuel? They won't have to hold on to their spent fuel. Um, and I'd also ask Dan Poneman, does the U.S. have an interest in how, in the, in how Japan decides this issue in the context of the policy that President Obama laid out at the Prague region more recently at the, in Hong Kong? Thanks. 
I, I didn't mention that the uh, safety uh, uh, regulation for the nuclear fuel cycle uh, is still underway. Uh, the new safety standard could be established by the end of the year. Until then, uh, location may not start up. So uh, uh, it's likely that uh, uh, the operation of new Rokasho facility will be postponed until probably early next year. Uh, for spent fuel disposal, at this moment, uh, still, as I said, the law, uh, under the law, utility cannot decide to dispose of spent fuel. And so the, the best thing they can do is to store spent fuel safely. And then uh, uh, if there's a reactor to burn plutonium, they can reprocess. Uh, other than that, no other plan. And then uh, part of the question you directed to me, our position is as it always has been, we obviously respect uh, Japan's sovereign right to choose its own energy policy. We're close uh, partners and allies. We'll continue to be supportive as uh, much as possible. And clearly when it comes to things like the Prague Agenda, we have a, a strong and continuing dialogue with our, our Japanese partners uh, on, uh, on all aspects of it. So I think the, we're now at this mic, Ralph Kosa. I don't know if it's hot. Keep speak. Uh, I'm just okay. <laughs> right. We have, I think, a very good uh, path forward, Ralph. It, it's not one that was shaped by our response to Fukushima, but it was clear to us uh, before that time, back in 2010, when President Obama asked Secretary Chu to put together a Blue Ribbon Commission, uh, because clearly we need uh, a back-end solution, A. B, clearly we need a consent-based uh, approach to it. Uh, I'm getting a little ahead of the story because that was, in fact, one of the principal findings of the very distinguished panel, which we think did a superb job. In January of 12, the Blue Ribbon Commission, co-chaired by Lee Hamilton and General Brent Scowcroft, came up with a number of recommendations about, uh, very importantly, a consent-based approach that talked about uh, also the governance mechanisms, that talked about funding mechanisms, and talked about a uh, approach of interim uh, and, and then uh, storage as well as long-term disposition. We're now on a path, obviously we'll need legislation for that. The administration's formal response to the Blue Ribbon Commission came out uh, in January of this year, and uh, we are now very encouraged that uh, conversations in the U.S. Congress suggest that there's gonna be traction. Uh, and I think, therefore, that we are in a better position today than in the many, many years I've been working on this issue to say we have a shot at developing a consent-based approach to the back end of the fuel cycle, which at the end of the day will be essential uh, for the continuation of an energy uh, source that uh, the success of which has to be measured in generations, and therefore we are gonna need that kind of broad-based support for whatever path we choose. And I think that uh, the plans going forward for interim storage followed by long-term uh, geologic disposal, I think uh, are, are now gonna get a very good hearing. Uh, let's see, which mic are we at? I think we're at Steve Dolly. Thank you. Uh, Steve Dolly with Platts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, what is the appropriate role of cost-benefit analysis for regulators considering requiring uh, safety enhancements in the wake of Fukushima? And uh, how can uh, such cost-benefit analyses and decisions based on them appropriately account for uh, qualitative factors like in enhanced uh, defense in depth that might come with some, some proposed improvements that might not meet strict cost-benefit analyses? I will turn to either of you. Well, I'll, I'll probably give a non-satisfying answer to that question. Uh, we really don't look, cost doesn't enter into what Wano does. We uh, look for uh, best practices in any number of areas and challenge our members to constantly be achieving those best practices. Um, there's, I think we're more with the regulator, as you mentioned, the cost-benefit analysis 
the regulator needs to establish an acceptable level of safety. That's the way I like to see it. And our organization goes beyond that, pushing towards excellence. So for us, cost benefit doesn't really come into it. If it's a best practice in the industry, we expect our members to try to adopt it. But I will say that 95% of what we promote, what we advocate with our members, our management leadership training uh, issues, they aren't hardware or modifications like that that lend themselves more to cost benefit. Thank you. Over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Noble, formerly with the State Department. Uh, I uh, ran a team that did uh, consequence management and that deployed to uh, Fukushima to help out there at one point. Um, I think we can all agree that accidents will happen. You can't eliminate them, especially with any kind of complicated technology. And cost benefit of any technology sort of depends on is the benefit of the technology worth the problems that any accident might cause. With nuclear power, the, the problem clearly is radiation. Um, and when we talk about mitigation of the radiation problem, basically all we could come up with was how to warn people faster and get them out of the way faster. Um, and I'm not sure if that's what you're talking about when you say you're uh, focusing more on mitigation. Um, but I wonder, is there any way, any thought being given, uh, and I know this has been part of the whole history of nuclear power, uh, to find a way to basically eliminate the threat of uh, radiation uh, leaks and, and radiation to surrounding populations. Because I think in the wake of Fukushima, obviously the Germans have already decided that that risk is not worth taking. Um, and a lot of others uh, are going to move in that direction as well. Thank you. I'll just say literally one sentence and then ask perhaps Tansu, because you, uh, you had a pass in the last round. Uh, we're always looking at ways to uh, limit, constrain uh, the risk of and consequences of, uh, and we'll continue to do so because it's part of our culture uh, as a process of continuous uh, safety improvement. Safety is paramount and will always uh, be so. But Tansel, would you want to add to that? Well, as I said, the, one of the most important lessons from the accident is that the risk is not zero. So I, I don't think we, we should not promise the public that nuclear risk can be uh, totally eliminated. Here's what I'm going to suggest, because I see there's five minutes left and there's four questioners. So if you don't mind, just so we can get the questions out, I think we'll get the four questions and then we'll each of us take a shot and okay. then hopefully we'll still end on time. So if we could turn to this mic. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I am Julian Galano from the Nuclear Regulatory Authority of Argentina. My question is for Mr. Suzuki. Uh, Mr. Suzuki, considering the accident of uh, Fukushima, uh, we in Argentina evaluate that accident more as an uh, institutional accident than a technological accident. I, I mean, we have the technology to prevent the black swan, but we, we should have the institutions to manage that, that, uh, that technology. Uh, and we evaluate uh, either that the reaction of Japan after Fukushima accident is very, very positive to, in order to change the institutional witnesses that you, you had maybe. I wanted to know, uh, if, if, if possible, I want you to clarify go, uh, deeper the, the clarification that you, you, you made about how the, the, the Japan authorities, uh, what are you doing to, to prevent, to, to guarantee the, the independence of, regu of the regulatory body in, in institutional terms? I mean, the economic independence, the salaries, Thank you. et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I should have said this, but this will only work if the questions are short. So. Uh, no, no preliminaries, just to ask the question. Matt Butt. So um, I wonder if there are lessons to be learned about international peer reviews and their effectiveness. Because now, after the accident, we're looking back and saying, oh, Japan wasn't meeting this standard, and they knew about tsunami risks and didn't do anything about it, and so on. And yet, you know, they'd had an international regulatory review just a few years before that sort of made a few modest criticisms, but basically said things were okay. They'd had WANA reviews. They were a frequent user of IEA OSART reviews. Um, does this suggest we really need to rethink how we do these reviews? Thank you. And we'll go to the front mic. Um, <clears throat> Stephanie Cook from Nuclear Intelligence Weekly. 
Um, I've been talking to some regulators, uh, previous commissioners of the NRC recently, and who point out a couple things. One is that our emergency response regulations still assume that 10-mile evacuation zone is appropriate, and so their cost-benefit analyses are based around that. The other thing is, is that U.S. reactors, the operating U.S. reactors were designed at a time when things like hydrogen explosions and core melts were not even allowed to be part of the discussion. Um, the NRC has recently kicked into a four-year rulemaking the issue of even putting filtered vents in BW, older BWRs, which makes European regulators, for one, kind of scratch their heads since they've had filtration since the early 80s, as I'm sure Dan knows. So I wonder how, and, and then of course you're probably aware of the comments of uh, Chairman Yasko, or former NRC Chairman Yasko, who thinks that our plants should be phased out after 40 years. So I wonder how you jive all those, um, very quick, I'm, um, admittedly, um, it's, a, it's a rather quick uh, summation of the other side of that argument, um, with your um, statements that things are safe and that we're doing everything possible to prevent a disaster in the United States. Thank you. And uh, the last question then? Uh, yes. Uh, Christopher Payne with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, uh, that previous questioner had some, some of what I was going to ask, uh, but let me just add to it. Do the members of the panel feel that in the wake of Fukushima that licensing standards nationally and globally should incorporate uh, land contamination and economic damage as an explicit criteria in licensing rather than follow the U.S. practice of simply pursuing avoided dose as the, uh, to the exposed population as the, as the main criteria. Right. Okay. So I think maybe we'll just move uh, from one side of the panel and then I'll uh, wrap up and uh, uh, we're, we, they, they gave us more. You can't give me more time after I've already called the question. Okay, so we'll, they, but we'll, we'll get through this uh, set, and then I think we'll have had a very good discussion. So, George. Well, the one that uh, seems to be uh, squarely in my area is, do we, I was hoping you do we need to them. rethink how to do reviews, uh, peer reviews? No question about it. And uh, in uh, Shenzhen, China, in October 2011, all of our members unanimously approved, unanimously approved sweeping changes to what we do in Wano as a direct result of gaps in what we were doing before Fukushima. We didn't look at emergency preparedness, just to give you one example. That's a big gap. We will look at emergency preparedness on every peer review in the future. So yes, the, the peer reviews need to be strengthened, and I think this this same sort of actions are being taken with the IAEA. Okay. Um, uh, my response to the question about uh, independent uh, nature of the uh, regulatory authority. Uh, there are two independent nature. One is legal institutional one. Second is technical independence. Right now, legal uh, institutional independent has been done in Japan, uh, although uh, technical independence is more difficult because staff uh, all now come from the previous uh, regulators. And uh, uh, we have to hire also uh, the new technical, uh, technically capable of staff, uh, which is not done yet. And there's only one uh, new applicant came to the NRA this year. So we have to recruit. So it may take some time to establish the technical independence, which is a challenging task for us. Um, the second uh, question is the role of international peer review or any peer review. I agree with, with uh, uh, Mr. Ford. But I think one, one important uh, measure to improve this situation is the, the so-called transparency of the uh, all kind of Operations. I think improving transparency will, will help to uh, have a more effective peer review functions. And finally, the uh, land contamination as a, a possible criteria. Personally, I feel that way too. I quite agree. When you go, go there on site, 
the off-site situation, uh, land contamination can uh, have an enormous social or political impact on the, uh, on the area. So I personally think it's, it's probably yes, but it's, I don't know how to do it. Uh, so uh, that's my answer. If you were President Obama, that fly would be dead by now. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Did anybody see that? On TV? <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, you couldn't have planned it this way, but I think there's actually a thematic uh, continuity in some of that last set of questions, and, and I will address it in, in that context since, uh, as at least some of you know, I'm not an engineer. And I would, I think, begin by actually agreeing with both of my colleagues uh, uh, to Matt Bunn's question. Uh, this is what we find over and over again, where you have a set of review processes, and this is not unique to nuclear or anything else, but you think you got something and it's written down well, and then you find out in the aftermath of something that it wasn't actually being carried out vigorously. And I think we just have to, maybe it's because I'm getting older, you just have to realize that people never quite live up to the ideals of effective execution of the things they've written down that you'd hope. And that's why every time we go back and try to rewrite a reg or try to do any of these things, it's all part of the process. You can't just write it down, put it on a shelf, say it's done, or just observe it in a very mechanical way. It's got to be something that's robust, and it's got to be something that has consequences. In, in the whole point of peer review is that there are people who hold each other in regard and who actually care about uh, the things that they're gathering to discuss. And so I think the answer will always be that we've got to do a better job uh, at peer review generally, A, and B, that the one thing in particular to guard against is that it does not become some kind of a mechanical check the box exercise that somehow becomes a substitute for very supple uh, energetic and creative, uh, as, as Tatsu was speaking earlier today, uh, out of the box thinking. So that's point one. In terms of the question, uh, the, the questions having to do with 10 mile evacuation zones, hydrogen accumulation, how do you jive all these things? Look, I mean, one thing that the NRA has just done that this country did back in 1974 in the uh, Atomic uh, Reorganization Act of 1974 was to split off the regulator from the programmatic uh, side of uh, uh, working nuclear energy, including promoting nuclear energy. And so I repose confidence, just like the Federalists did, John Jay and Hamilton, in, in putting a structure in place that's got some separation so the people who've got responsibilities uh, are not the people who are also uh, in charge of actually doing the work. And that means, so for those facilities that are NRC regulated, I presume that, uh, and I trust that they will, and I'm not from a Department of Energy standpoint going to uh, speak on behalf of them here. That would be the wrong thing to do, and it's inconsistent with the statute. But that is what they do each day and every day. I see uh, Margie Doan out there from NRC. They will not permit, uh, my understanding of the law is they will not permit a reactor to operate one day if it is not being done safely by the criteria that they have laid out. When it comes to those facilities that are the responsibility of the Department of Energy, A, we take programmatic responsibility, and I can assure you we do look at questions of hydrogen accumulation, dosages, and, and, and the things that Chris raised and so forth, but we don't simply rely on our programmatic managers. We have both some uh, internal oversight mechanisms that are reporting not up through the program managers, but reporting straight to the office of the secretary so that they can blow the whistle if they find something that is untoward and is not being addressed. And in addition, the Congress obviously has legislated and the president signed into law the Defense Nuclear Facility Safety Board, and I can assure you that they are assiduous uh, custodians of anything having to do with safety. So uh, this is never a quest that will be finished. It's always an area where we'll constantly try to improve and reduce any risk to the public, to the operators, because safety is paramount. And uh, you can't pursue any energy source, but certainly not nuclear, responsibly and well in a way that you'd be proud to tell your kids about it when you got home from work if you didn't take that with the utmost seriousness. Uh, our job will never, therefore, be done. We will never be able to eliminate risk from nuclear or any other realm of human endeavor, but I think it's something always worth striving for. And if I may say, 
to have people to help us think it through and work those issues of the caliber of George Felgate and Tetsu Suzuki. Uh, we are very fortunate indeed, so I hope that uh, everyone will join me in thanking them and thanking yourselves for a good panel. Thank you. Thank you.